Thank you. Before I offer a footnote to Jose, I'm going to offer a footnote to Bob. And uh, you probably six months from now won't remember anything I say this evening. Maybe you might remember everything that Jose said this evening, but this you'll remember. Um, I guarantee. So Bob mentioned the Cultural Revolution of the 60s and its derivatives today. Remember, in the 1960s, more Christian radio shows were founded than rock radio shows. Okay? And that's not irrelevant to this whole discussion, and it's not irrelevant to something else. Jose mentioned American exceptionalism. In another generation, in another time, American exceptionalism was not used to explain the religiosity of the American populace, but was used to explain or to de delineate the failure of socialism in the United States. All these things are connected. That's just by the way. Um, but I mention this, or I start with this, because I've been responding to Jose so often that I know it's just plain silly to presume to add anything to his sweeping and cogent analysis of such concepts of secular, secularity, and secularization. Instead, and you'll hear echoes of what Jose's lecture here. Instead, though, what I'd like to do is take one theme that he raised, which is the fundamental dichotomy we posit between the religious and the secular. And I want to try to argue, as he intimated, that it's not a particular helpful one to use as we struggle to understand the challenges of social life in the contemporary world. As Jose rightly claims, we tend to use the concepts of religion and secularity or secular culture or secularization as if these were objective, universal, and value-free concepts that can be used to characterize aspects of social life that are not religious. Religion and religious too are used as universal, objective, and value-free concepts. Like him, I too believe that this approach is fundamentally flawed. And I too think that both religion and secularism are concepts that developed in a very particular and Christian context, can be used helpfully to describe aspects and periods in the coming to be of Christian civilization, but do not actually serve us well when we come to discuss, analyze, and understand other traditional civilizations or other civilizations within which tradition is changing and being renegotiated. And here is where I part company just a bit with our speaker. As my, in my understanding, Jose is still trying to make room for an emic understanding of what social scientists call religion from within a social science lexicon. And I wish to query, at least to query, if the lexicon itself is perhaps too limited to adequately embrace the phenomena in question. And you hinted at that at the end of your, of your talk. And, you know, let's be practical. What, for example, is a secular Jew? What of a Jew who observes no commandments, goes to synagogue only on Yom Kippur, and does not otherwise maintain any traditional practices? Is he secular or partially religious or what? How do we characterize China with a population of 1.3 billion? Engelhardt has characterized China as the most irreligious country in the world. But if we consider the proliferation of spirit cults and other forms of worship, it becomes clear that this is not secularism in the general use of the term. What of the case of Islam? What of the individual or community whose observance of traditional commandments are partial or almost non-existent? What of the Muslim who eats during Ramadan, but only in private, in hiding, away from communal eyes? Is he secular or hypocritical? What if she who does not eat during Ramadan, but does drink wine occasionally? What of those communities in Central Asia who celebrate the Eid by drinking vodka? Actually, there's wonderful pictures from Kyrgyzstan of a whole group on, take, on the way to the plane to go to the Hajj, all of them lifting up a glass, right? It's fantastic. Um, are these people secularists or sinners or just plain ignorant? Or are they, as are so many, engaged in a never-ending movement, interpretation, and transformation of that tradition that is always continually being negotiated and negotiated anew by communities and individuals over the course of time. 
I would in fact claim, as we heard, that secularism is a very particular moment in the Christian process of negotiating its own tradition, as was the Protestant Reformation, and is the, as is the phenomena of Christian fundamentalism. All are particular moments in the way the concrete practice of tradition mediates, transforms, and negotiates the tradition of practices that define the civilizational endeavor. That a particular moment of this negotiation in Christianity is, in, is understood in terms of secularization has much to do with the privileging of belief over practice, of faith over works, and of innerlichkeit over an external practice that has been part of Christianity from its origins, as evinced, evinced among, in many things in the rejection of Jewish law and the very particular allegorical way of reading and interpreting scripture. This moment was one which, as is well known, received particular emphasis during the Protestant Reformation of the 16th century. Secularism as unbelief, I want to posit, is thus the complement of tradition understood primarily in terms of belief rather than practice. The consequent use, I would say misuse of this term, to characterize other civilizational endeavors, the Jewish, the Islamic, the Hindu, the Confucian, and so on, is simply the spoils of war, as it were, a consequent of the power differentials between the Christian, Jewish, Islamic, Indian, and Chinese civilizations. Indeed, as I've already hinted at, I would much prefer to replace the dichotomy of religion and secular with that of tradition of practices, practice of tradition, as being a more structural, less particularistic, historicist, and Whiggish way of conceptualizing what is usually understood as the dichotomy between religious and secular individuals, cultures, and communities. We should recall, as Jose did, that Europe is the secular exception in a world that is overwhelming, overwhelmingly religious. Or, in the terms I am offering here, European civilization is one where traditional practices have been most abandoned and rejected, a fact that can be ascertained by visiting any of the churches in Europe and calculating the average age of those in attendance on any given Sunday. Moreover, this rejection of tradition is intimately tied up with the overwhelming terms of collective identity. Again, in fact, both phenomena are probably related. The peace of Westphalia and the concept of curious religio, ius religio, may be central here, as Jose indicated. Europe, which was Christian, became rather a continent of nation states, and in different ways, traditional practices were subsumed within new national identities. I note this because it brings us directly to one of what I believe to be the great fallacies of social science research on what we call religious phenomena. And that is the study of religion in terms of identity. This is in fact the primary language that social scientists have to discuss what today, discuss today what goes under the rubric of religion. As social scientists are not generally the followers of any sacred tradition, except perhaps that of August Comte, they can but translate, the, that was a joke by the way, they can but translate the behavior, attitudes, and dispositions that they find into a language that they understand. And the result is a rather simplistic understanding of sacred tradition in terms of the eminently modern problem of identity, whether for individuals or for collectivities. And from identity, we can of course develop increasing concerns with authenticity, fundamentalism, collective boundaries, value orientations, preferences, and a host of additional conceptual categories which are, at the end of the day, nothing but our own attempt to translate a set of sacred practices into the languages of the secular social sciences. There's nothing inherently wrong with this, other than it does not get us anywhere near the phenomena it presumes to explain. For an observant Muslim, or Jew, or Jain, or Sikh, does not, at the end of the day, do identity, or nor do they do religion as they go about their daily rituals. Rather, they are following a tradition, a way of being. Both halakha in Judaism and sharia in Islam mean way or path. Christianity is referred to that as well in the Acts of the Apostles. That today, under the onslaught of modernity and modern conceptualizations, many Jews and Muslims conceive themselves 
as doing identity, not to mention identity politics, is precisely what has given rise to phenomena that we turn fundamentalist. But here again, we do not really observe the reality in question. Rather, we translate it into categories convenient to our way of thinking. What often goes unremarked is that the roots of this so-called fundamentalism are of the same stuff as the ideology of the social scientists. That is, a secular ideology focused on individual and group identity and the realization, or if we use 19th century categories of romantic nationalism, the expressive realization of both. Think further. Hence, the suicide bomber who leaves a note that begins not with Bismin Allah, in the name of Allah, but a note that begins in my name, in the name of my family, this is precisely religion as a modern ideology, as a form of self-expression. It shares a conceptual framework with our own social scientific inquiry. It does not, however, even begin to encompass the meaning, or perhaps meanings, held by what we term religion for time out of mind. For what was meant by religion before the contemporary period was not a value, not a preference, and definitely not an identity. What is taken for religion by social scientists, but has for billions of people in the world been understood as their own sacred traditions, is in fact a response to the problem of being. The fact that most social scientists no longer understand this as a problem and as a perpetual challenge to the human endeavor leads them to a critical methodological error. For they impute their own ethic categories on their informants and treat their own categories as emic ones. They construct great edifices of theory, but the explanatory potential of these theoretical edifices is severely compromised. For essentially, social scientists working with a model of the self as an autonomous moral decisor, that is with a model of the liberal self, cannot really conceive of a social agent as, as anything but an entity that either has or does not have something in this case, choices, or as an agent who affects actions. That is, again, someone who makes things, in this case, choices. We have preferences, and we make choices based on these preferences. Most of social science is devoted to this. The great debates within the social scientists are, of course, over the sources of these preferences, whether in some sort of conscience collective or in a more Humean or perhaps Hobbesian calculus of individual interests. No one, however, doubts the existence of choice and the autonomy of the agent who chooses. What I have tried to hint at, have, no more than hint at, is that this itself is a very particular construction of a self. No more, or no less reasonable than any other, but one that perhaps leaves us in the dark about the motivations, understandings, and existence of billions of individuals today and in the past who do not understand themselves as morally autonomous actors, but rather see themselves as acting out heteronomously imposed norms where the only choice is to observe God's commandments or not. And this is a good distance from the type of choice that rational actor theories or even more culturalist readings of the self understand at the core, as being at the core of social action. What I am suggesting is that the very use of secularism in something, something in contrast to religious betrays a particular historical, religious, and even ideological heritage. That of necessity clouds one's glasses and skewers one's assumptions when approaching the world of social phenomena. Remember that the very term religion does not exist in other civilizations. It originated as a concept in Roman law, and it carries with it a very particular cultural baggage and no end of ambiguous meanings, and that from the period of late antiquity. As William Cantwell Smith taught us in the pre-Christian era, it was best understood as an adjective rather than a substantive. If something was religio for me, it meant it was mighty incumbent on me to do it. With the early church fathers and later Augustine, religio really becomes the way to posit boundaries and to distinguish the followers of the true religion, Christianity, and a false of those false beliefs and practices. It is, if you will, a full-fledged ideology of Ant la Lethe. And we should beware of ideologies in the marketplace as well as in the study hall. Thank you. <laughs>